And we're here at the offices of the Progressive Magazine with George Lakey. A great honor, George, to have mm -hmm. you with us here at the Progressive. Uh, and this on the occasion of a book tour for your brand new book, Dancing with History, A Life for Peace and Justice, that really goes through so many of the stories of your life and how you, uh, you got to be where you are today. I want to start out by just talking a little bit about that. What, what made you, as a 12-year-old, <laughs> become, become the activist that, uh, that you have remained for, uh, uh, for the 73 years since then? I was a truly naive 12-year-old <laughs> who believed that my elders understood the world and understood what right and wrong was and so on. And so when I was asked to be uh, to do a tryout as, as a boy preacher, because in the evangelical world that I inhabited, there was such a thing as a boy preacher. And so uh, when I was asked to do a tryout, I was thrilled that they would think that I could even do that. You know? And then I asked God what I should preach about, and the subject came to me that it should be racial equality. So I, obedient boy that I was, uh, crafted a sermon on, on why God wants racial equality. And that's what I preached. And I flunked my <laughs> my tryout because that church did not want to hear that <laughs> uh, you know small town rural pennsylvania they did not want 1949 no thank you we don't want that and no more of you and that set up the opposition that i think is part of probably any radical's life is to realize oh my gosh it's not that the whole world unites around uh, particular values but that there are people who are opposed to that and where do I stand? Well, so that became obvious to me. I'm, I'm going to stand with the right, yeah, the right thing. Yeah. The right thing. The right uh, thing as opposed to the right. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, one of the things about your life and your work that is, um, that's inspiring is that it's all really very intentional. I mean, you really, you really look at things from a movement perspective, from an organization building perspective. Talk, talk about that a little bit, about how you came to that understanding and how it plays out in your, your everyday work. My 11th grade teacher was very important to me about that because he was a social studies teacher who was fascinated with movements. Mm -hmm. And so he would talk about pro the progressive movement, you know, and the labor movement and so on. So I got this idea young, whoa, so the, pro the, the social justice that we want, the degree to which we get it is a product of social movements. Mm -hmm. And that's a question of intentionality and people actually getting together and making it happen and so on. So it seemed to me na as natural as anything that when at age 19, I realized, oh my gosh, this is what my life is about. My life is about making uh, justice and peace. Then I thought, well, then obviously social movements are the way to go about it, but obviously movements can make wise decisions and can make foolish decisions <laughs> about how to work and what to work on and so on. And that all is a quite question of craft. I thought, and knowing uh, knowing the history of other movements that have failed and succeeded, and all of that, so it it was uh, I'm you know I was I'm a child of the working class. It's all of the, about craft and figuring out things, how things work, and this doohickey fits into this space and that kind of thing. And it just seemed so obvious, and and I didn't understand the uh, the, the 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 idealists I ran into from higher classes who who made it very mystical you know and uh, a matter of uh, I don't know what seemed to me to be distant uh, playing with words mm -hmm. uh, whereas I thought no you know just get sensible do do stuff that works mm -hmm. so one of the things in this kind of going from movement or or, mm -hmm. or cause or activity is you always bring other people up you create organizations that can live beyond your leadership of them so talk about that a little bit well i do believe that uh, when people associate and make some progress together it's just completely natural for them to want to stay together 
And uh, because part of it is, it's a dangerous world, it's a scary world, and whoa, you know, it's, it's a friendship maker. An organization can be a friendship maker. I don't think it's, it, it's great to go too far in that direction so that people become um, close to others mm -hmm. and therefore the thing can't grow, but there does need to be that glue, mm -hmm. I think, that helps. And once the glue uh, uh, forms, then it's natural for people to want to hang on to that. Mm -hmm. and, and I really support that. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some of the different um, movements that you've been a part of and the stories that you, that you tell in the book, beginning with civil rights. Hmm. The civil rights movement was pivotal for me, and I'm still using the lessons that I've learned. For example, one of the things that's, uh, that I find on this book tour is tremendous anxiety. Uh, and, and the anticipation that things are going to get worse before they get better, which is, I think, accurate. Things will get worse before they get better. And, and, one of the, and part of the, the fantasy of anxiety is that the right wing is going to get more and harder and harder on us and bring more and more violence that will come from the militias or whatever it comes from and so on. And one of the supports for me of having uh, dug into the civil rights movement, participated in the civil rights movement, is that it can't get worse than it was for the civil rights movement in the Deep South, which is not where I was, in the Deep South, when there was a terrorist organization whose whole job was to eliminate uppity black people, mm -hmm. right? And that's not going to be we're not going to experience that degree of terror. So relax folks in the North <laughs> and relax folks everywhere because the Ku Klux Klan and the, the, the out and out terrorism with which they, uh, they had the blank check really in places like Mississippi and Alabama, that's not here and that's not going to be here. So uh, I'm not saying there's not reason to be afraid. There is and I get afraid. I, I, don't, I hate it when the jail cell door clangs against the steel. Mm -hmm. And as many times as I've been arrested, I still hate that sound. I anticipate it. It's going to happen. It happens, and I hate it. And so I'm not saying we shouldn't you know, be alive to our fears. On the other hand, from an objective point of view, when we get that chance to be objective, we just have to realize the civil rights movement showed it's possible to build movements with the Ku Klux Klan and wanting you dead. And it's possible, thank goodness, for nonviolence, because that's what makes it possible. It's possible to build movements that grow and grow and actually achieve results that the Ku Klux Klan had every expectation it would prevent from happening. We can achieve amazing things despite terrorist uh, uh, opposition, and we need to hang on to that realization because there are a lot of countries where there's not a civil rights movement in their past, and they can't look back and say, oh, it can be done, and we are so lucky, so let's use it. Uh, the, the last organization I started, we started in the living room watching civil rights movies. And we watched a whole series of civil rights movies and, and talked deeply about that and then realized, oh, the thing we want to start, an environmental you know, group that would uh, address climate, it's, a good, it's going to be a piece of cake compared with what folks in Alabama and Mississippi went through. Mm -hmm. One of the things about the civil rights movement I think that makes it different from a, a number of the subsequent movements is that it was really rooted in the working class and the church. That's right. And you yourself do a lot of your organizing and activism out of a, uh, a faith-based uh, uh, mm -hmm. context. So talk about that. So. Oh, that's very important to me. It has always been important to me in my life, and so retaining it has been a source of strength. I, I don't think it's necessary in, in the sense that people can't find other, you know, uh, uh, inspiration and support. But I'm very grateful that I happened to be born into a family that was religious and that uh, gave me that, you know, that impetus. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, for folks who, uh, who could see the value of it and kind of wish they had it, um, I want them always to be aware that they can get next to folks who are faith-based and uh, and experience it some, some through continuity mm -hmm. and and uh, contiguity. And so I'm I'm very much for mixing things up rather than uh, you know uh, trying trying to draw lines between the faith-based people and the non-faith-based people. Yeah. 
Um, you grew up in an evangelical household, but really right. now today you're a Quaker. And That's right. A very different, very different. kind of <laughs> approach to, to um, yeah. religion. But working with the Quakers, a lot of people, um, I think, may think of, of the Quakers as not necessarily activist, but there is a, a strong history of activism in the, uh, in the Quaker faith. Very strong history, and I draw on that. One of my first, in fact, my very first sociological uh, published research paper was based on long interviews with a Quaker who brought woman suffrage over the line <laughs> after uh, decades and decades and decades of struggle, right? Uh, Alice Paul mm -hmm. brought it over the line. She was a Quaker. She brought it over the line by starting an extremely polarizing a confrontation with Woodrow Wilson when he was president and just really uh, led women into confrontations where men were beating them up on the street where violence was being held and then when they were thrown in jail they were fasting and therefore force-fed and so on. They were constantly upping the temperature of the nation with regard to the question of women's suffrage and it was her belief in the value of polarization that br brought women's suffrage to happen in the U.S. early, much earlier than it did in Britain, where there was a parallel movement. Uh, so that is a way in which I'm different from a lot of Quakers who tend to be conflict averse um, and justify that as part of our peace testimony. I don't think our peace testimony leads me to be conflict averse. In fact, it leads me into conflict. And so that's a difference that I have from Quakers. On the other hand, the, uh, the, the, uh, a lot of Quakers do have that. I mean, Quakerism does have that history of polarization that in the 17th century was I mean, it was, it was a very radical and very revolutionary faith to hold. So I can keep appealing to that. And at times when I'm driving my fellow Quakers crazy, they, I can remind them that uh, if they might find some reason to excuse me from my polarizing tendencies by remembering the 17th century when Quakerism was born. <laughs> and Quakers, of course, uh, uh, were a, a key um, group in the uh, opposition to the U.S. war in Vietnam, and you you have yes. some stories about your participation in that. Talk about that movement. Well, that was the scariest thing that I did, and that was one way that I really leaned on my Quaker meeting because I felt led by God to uh, volunteer to go into the war zone uh, around Vietnam and confront uh, warships. Uh, in order to break through the uh, zone that had been created there and uh, preventing uh, uh, medical supplies for the civilians who were suffering in the war. And the reason we chose medical supplies, there's an old Quaker tradition of medical relief for people who are caught in war. So we were drawing on our own traditional base, but also because we kept believing that um, one reason Americans were willing to stand for, to tolerate so much horrible, uh, uh, horrible killing and hurting of Vietnamese, way worse than what Putin is doing in Ukraine. Uh, one, willing, one reason I think Americans were willing to put up with that was because of racism. Mm -hmm. That is, the Vietnamese were not being perceived by Americans as humans, mm -hmm. as humans. So we wanted to really address that. These are humans, and we're willing to risk our lives for the sake of bringing medicines to these human beings. On the other hand, I was a dad, I had a family responsibility. Um, was it, you know, was it sensible for me to risk my life in that way? So I went to my Quaker meeting and I said, "Would you appoint a committee to meet with me and help me, you know, get through? You know, who knows? Maybe I'm trying to grandstand, or you know, I'm a drama queen, so maybe that's what's going on here." Uh, so I went the the uh, frank and honest probing and pushing of my fellow Quakers to see whether this is what we call rightly ordered, you know, this is really what God wants. And they sat with me and they prayed with me and they decided, yes, it was that God had tapped me on the shoulder and said, go on over there, George. And they said, we will take care of your family if you don't come back alive. So having that uh, faith community as a support, that's an amazing thing in my life. Yeah. So after, after the 60s and 70s, things changed a lot in this country and there was a lot more focus on uh, 
individuals and uh, you know I'm okay you're okay let's let's uh, <laughs> you know let's take care of ourselves first but <laughs> you started another organization that was about bringing people together in community and living in a way to build um, a what the new society could be. And so let's talk a bit about the movement for a new society. Part of the impulse for that was realizing because of the experience of the 60s that uh, the, uh, the, t the task really to change our country because of the way we dug into empire, uh, an empire posture with regard to the rest of the world, and because we're run basically by the economic elite, uh, that we're actually gonna have to wage a nonviolent revolution in order to get our country, back, uh, you know, to a place where we can be proud of it, and a nonviolent revolution is not, uh, is not, you know, let's do that this year. <laughs> this is going to be a long building process of multiple mass movements that are going to have to develop the capacity to be in a coalition together to gang up on the economic elite. It's quite a big project. So I thought, well, then we need an, a structure an organizational structure that will support people to be in it for the long run. So this won't be just a, hey, let's go do a protest, or hey, this is a season for you know making trouble. No, 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 this is going to be uh, a, a big commitment. And so, we cre and so I did uh, create a structure that would enable people to be in, in it for the long run, which means also a lot of personal transformation because we all bring to the movement both positives and negatives. <laughs> and so we, we made a premium of uh, personal growth so that we become more and more effective comrades with each other as we supported each other to do more and more dynamic things. And we, we took on specific campaigns like nuclear power, and we were partly responsible for doing in nuclear power in this country. I'm very, very proud of that, Victor. And, and other, other projects that we took on that sometimes were uh, sometimes more successful than we expected them to be. So that was a 20-year run uh, that I learned a lot from, and I think uh, we made a real contribution. Today, of course, the, uh, um, you know, there's obviously you know, still the threat of nuclear war. There's, there's, there's many civil conflicts happening around the globe, but it seems like the preeminent issue is the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. And you uh, took it upon yourself to find a niche in the, <laughs> in the responses to climate that would be a, a, a Quaker-based direct action effort, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. equate the uh, uh, yeah. Quaker Action Team, uh, Earth Quaker Action Team. Earth Quaker Action Team, um, yeah. Talk about, talk about that and, and where that led. I learned that from one of my mentors, that every movement has an ecology. And just like you go into a forest and there's this kind of tree and that kind of tree, also in a movement, you have these organizations. But there are ecological niches that are not filled. <laughs> and I realized, whoa, there's a chance within the Quaker ecology to create a rebel style organization that would focus on nonviolent direct action and do campaigns that were hard driving, polarizing campaigns. And so we chose uh, as our first campaign to go after the seventh largest bank in the country. I smile as I say it because it, it seemed so improbable at the time that a group that could fit in my living room, which is where we started, would be successful against the seventh largest bank in the country. But uh, I thought they had a vulnerability that we could go after it successfully, and we did. It took five years because we started so small, um, but we grew, 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 and we gave them such a hard time nonviolently. We disrupted their operations in so many banks, first just in one state, right, and then in two states, and then in three states. And we were able to get to 13 states within a 24-hour period, disrupting their operations. Twice we've shut down their shareholders' meetings. I mean, those are the owners. The, the owners of the bank. We were in the room with the owners of the bank and we shut them down <laughs> nonviolently. It was so exciting to do that and so empowering to know that we could do that. So we, because uh, we did that uh, so uh, uh, successfully and with a, 
a bright spirit, so more and more people joined, obviously, to make it possible, we were able to actually drive that bank out of that business. They, they just decided, as far as they could tell, we were never going to stop growing. We were only going to get more and more disruptive. And they had to ask themselves, is this, uh, you know, even though it's lucrative for us to blow up mountains for coal, uh, it, it isn't paying us as an organization anymore to do that. <laughs> and the, 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 uh, the reputational cost as well for a corporation. Mounting and mounting yeah. and mounting, yeah. So I'm very excited about the current Chase campaign and, and the other campaigns that focus on the money because after all, it's, it's a money-governed yeah. operation in their country, yeah. So since the election of Donald Trump, and I will say that this it certainly preceded Donald Trump. Uh, in fact, we might even say that um, since the election of Barack Obama, uh, we have seen a growing polarization mm -hmm. in this country, most visible since the election of Donald Trump, perhaps, but the, uh, the rise of the Tea Party, which was, of course, corporate funded as well. Um, but this polarization that has spread across the country is in many ways very disempowering to people because mm -hmm. people look at that and they say, you know, everything is so divided. How are we ever going to, you know, we can't sit at the dinner table with our relatives and have a conversation anymore. <laughs> right. You have kind of a different perspective on that. So let's, I do. let's I talk do. a little bit about polarization and particularly how that idea, this, this thinking has come out of your work on uh, looking at the economies of other countries, the Nordic, hmm. Northern European countries, in particular your book Viking Economics, for instance. How did that influence your thinking about polarization in this country, and where do you see our responses to polarization uh, going? Well, the question you're asking is a little awkward for me to answer because it I have to admit, it was the biggest professional mistake I made in my life <laughs> because I assumed, my f profession being sociology, and I assumed that when a society polarizes, it makes it more difficult to make progress. And that's as so when I was watching the increasing polarization of a dozen years ago, I was thinking, oh, wow, this is bad because how are we going to get more racial justice and so on and so on? How are we going to address climate well if we can't agree on anything, if we're just sniping at each other, as you say, even over the Thanksgiving dinner? So how are we going to do this? That was my assumption, but it turned out to be incorrect. And as you say, it was the Viking economics book that really got me going because I had to. I didn't have to, but I really wanted to understand the history of those countries and when it was that they made their big leap forward uh, because they're in such better shape than we are, but they used to be in much worse shape than we are. So how is it that they could make that leap forward? So I looked carefully at that history and I found out they made their leap forward at exactly the time of the greatest polarization in modern times for those countries, for Norway, Sweden, Denmark. And I thought, this doesn't compute at all. I have this negative read of polarization as in terms of progressive causes, and, and they made their big progress during. So how is this possible? So I was very upset by this and, uh, and, and kept worrying and worrying about it. And then I thought, well, George, you could look at more cases. <laughs> you don't have to just freeze on that, right? So how about the 1930s, the decade I was born? Talk about polarization, growing Nazi movement, filling Madison Square Garden for a rally and so on. Nazis growing on the one hand, communist period, uh, the glory period of the American Communist Party. I mean, I would call that a difference. <laughs> Tremendous uproars, workers occupying factories of major corporations and so on. And during that period, the Ku Klux Klan, of course, lynching like crazy. That was the period when we made the greatest progress in the first half of the 20th century. What to make of this? So quick, George, another case, another case. How about the 60s? 1960s in the United States? Oh my gosh, so clear that we, it was tremendous polarization. The American Nazis came back and so on. Ku Klux Klan going wild. And at the same time, uh, tremendous growth of the left. And it was the period of the greatest progress that we made in the second half of the 20th century. So I have it wrong that the polarization shuts down progress. In fact, there's an argument that polarization opens up the chance for progress. 
So I'm, um, I, I, I'm, it takes me a while to try to figure this out because it doesn't make s metaphorical sense, if you know what I mean. Even, even if numbers like add up, sometimes they still don't quite add up for us. And so uh, what saved me was running into an artist who showed me the forge that he uses to work with metal and said, I need to make my metal malleable to make art out of it. I said, that's what polarization is. Polarization is a forge that heats things up. And what you make of it, okay, so this artist guy, he makes art, but a blacksmith uses a forge to make horseshoes, and the forge couldn't care less whether you're making metal or whether you're making horseshoes. It's just heating the, it's make, making malleable the material, right? And that's how polarization is. It doesn't have a, an opinion about what's to come out of it. It is neither negative or positive. It's just making things malleable. It's melting norms, for example. January 6th, melting norms. And then what we do with the melting norms, well, that's our choice. And so that freed me up to realize there's a reason why movements grew so rapidly in the 60s grew so rapidly in the 30s, why they did so well in the Nordic countries, because polarization is can be on our side if we use it. Now, if we shut down in anxiety, obviously, we're missing our chance. And the right wing, we use it, and we'll do what happened in Germany during polarization, which was going to Hitler, mm -hmm. or Italy, you know, Mussolini. So we can go, yes, we can go to the right wing. That's certainly possible. So my friends were worried about that. Yeah, there's good reason to worry about that. On the other hand, to spend your time worrying instead of acting <laughs> is pretty much to guarantee it will go wrong. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we act like artists or blacksmiths and make good stuff happen, then that's our opportunity. It's our biggest opportunity. So let's use it to the full. So I, at 85 years old, frankly, I must tell you, I am so glad to be alive at this moment because it's our biggest opportunity in my lifetime to make major, major change. And I'm so happy to be aware, <laughs> alive for it. So polarization is the forge, the yes. thing that heats the metal. Exactly. But as you say, the polarization or the forge doesn't know what it's doing and it has to be directed. Right. And that's, I think, where, where movements come in. That's it. You need something to, f to create a structure that tells the hammer and the forge <laughs> how to shape that piece of metal. That's right. And so that's the question is, I think, how do we build that, those structures so that when the polarization moment confronts us, is available to us, where do we go with that? And that's the reason why I wrote before this book, How We Win, which is a kind of Red Cross handbook on how to build strong movements that can take maximum advantage of the polarization. So How We Win is a very popular book, and I'm uh, pushing that as I do this book tour. But also, it uh, was another reason why I wrote the memoir, because the memoir is dancing with whatever it is that the music is playing <laughs> in history, and this is now the music of a very jive guy. I mean, it's a very, very strong beat that we've got in the music pushing us, and let's dance fully with it, yeah. And then in the, in the memoir are a lot of specific examples of, that's one reason why I refer so specifically sometimes to what we did in particular moments in order to build strong organizations, mm -hmm. yeah. So right now we're seeing, you know, this incredible pushback from, from the right. I mean, in, in some ways it's kind of, you know, the, the last gasp of the, of the old guard that knows that they're losing their power. And so you have the Tea Party rising up, um, you know, during the early years of Obama, stoked by money from the Koch brothers and so mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. You have um, mm -hmm. the period of, of the presidency of Donald Trump and the, uh, you know, uh, huge percentage of people who still adhere to, uh, you know, the, the notion that... Uh, um, he won the election. He won the election, <laughs> right. And you also have, you know, sort of smaller instances like the two legislators that were just expelled yeah. from the Tennessee yeah. state legislature, yeah. one of them back in now, the other one probably will be back in uh, by tomorrow. But um, 
these kind of pushbacks, I think we need to have movements that are prepared to confront those, right? So how, mm -hmm. how do we do that? Well, yeah, we need to expect the right will get stronger and stronger because that's what polarization is about. And the left will get stronger and stronger, and it is. Uh, but but uh, both, both sides, the leaders on the left and on the right, can make big mistakes. <laughs> they, can, they can really, you know, not use their opportunities well. So because I'm on the left, I want us to use the opportunities to the max. Mm -hmm. And that's why I wrote the book, uh, How We Win. Mm -hmm. We need, first of all, to give up um, using our energy for one-off demonstrations. I mean, Dr. King long ago observed that it's campaigns that deliver the goods, not protests, mm -hmm. not these one-off protests. Give them up. Uh, I occasionally go along on one if my friends are going, because we just have a good friendship time. <laughs> But I don't for a minute think those demonstrations do a thing. I know it's campaigns that do it. So that's number one, is organize campaigns, don't bother with protests. And then the campaigns, of course, build a movement, but then as the stronger the movement becomes, the more interesting it becomes to other movements who are also building uh, as a coalition partner. We need to get to the point where our movements are in coalition with each other, which gives a lot of people encouragement to join because they see it itself assembling. It's, it's, uh, it only it, there's only a certain number of people who are willing to join a, what looks to be a, a kind of a losing proposition, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and movements by themselves can only get so much done. So a lot of anxiety I, on this book tour, I'm meeting so many young people who are very, very anxious because they don't see the climate movement growing rapidly enough to be able to deal with the climate disasters that are already affecting us. But the climate movement, if it goes into a coalition with the Black Lives Matter movement and with the peace movement and so on and so on, the togetherness, bigger, more attractive, more reassuring, oh, I will throw myself into the movement because it looks like it's really growing and it's becoming mighty. And I want to be part of a mighty force because I, I want to be able to have you know, children someday. And it looks like I don't, I don't want any children if we're just doomed. And so that kind of dynamic, it's an emotional dynamic, and it's, but it's, it's a consequence of decisions we make. And if we stick with these protests that don't go anywhere and don't have an impact, in fact, uh, confirm people's cynicism and belief that uh, we can't win, because you have a big demonstration, then nothing, you know, Black Lives Matter hardly won anything. That was not an encouragement to have another you know, to, to do more action. But campaigns, on the other hand, are encouragement, and that's where we need to invest. Yeah. It was interesting, um, during uh, one of your talks uh, earlier in the week, somebody raised that issue of Black Lives Matter as an example of your idea of polarization creating, creating uh, the possibility for change. Mm -hmm. And to me, the, the thing that was happening at the same time as Black Lives Matter, but got much less publicity, was what I'll call the mutual aid movement. Hmm. The growth of all these different mutual aid organizations around the country that were in some cases responding to COVID, in some cases responding to the needs of people that were involved in Black Lives Matter, you know, people who were getting hurt by police and so on. But this idea of mutual aid, I think, is, is a real template to look at kind of how we build local, regional, and mm -hmm. potentially national organizations. And for me, a lot of it um, ties to the co-op movement. Mm -hmm. And the history that we have here in the United States, uh, much of it adopted from uh, you know Northern European countries as well. But the history that we have in the United States of cooperatives and the, the kind of structure that's involved in people cooperating to build both an economy but also a social support network. That was one of the things that I really present strongly in the Viking Economics book, that while the labor unions were polarizing like crazy, growing, growing, growing uh, in force, the student revolutionaries, of course, were organizing and so on, the co-op movement 
uh, in Norway, Sweden, Denmark, were, was growing like mad also. And that was hugely reassuring because people could see that folks were developing uh, managerial smarts, you might say, like or the ability to do large uh, on a larger and larger scale organizing that would gave people confidence that they could replace the uh, economic elite's way of organizing the economy, which works fine for the economic elite, but not for anybody else. And that that growth of confidence meant that the vision that was being put forward by the social movements. Of, of a very, very, very uh, radically different uh, future became believable, became credible. So the, the co-op movement was a credibility builder, you might say, and also giving people, of course, confidence, hey, we can do shit. And so that that's very, very, very important. And, and giving people economic advantage as well, right? I mean, you know, the, the, the fact that- Very immediate. You know, there's not some uh, big rich guy that's taking, you know, 60% of every dollar that you earn. It's it's something that's shared among the people in the cooperative and benefits the, the group absolutely, as a whole. Absolutely, 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 yeah. yeah. And we see that too, I think, like in some of the uh, the local responses to disasters like the Haiti earthquake and so on, mm -hmm. where you have these communities of people that develop these sharing economies to respond where the government isn't there to provide them the resources. The rich people and the corporations certainly aren't there to provide them the resources. It's trust building, right? And we, we need that trust to cohere when the right, you know, does its, uh, it, its repression job. Yeah. So what next? What next for George Lakey? What next for um, uh, you know the work that you're doing? You're on the book tour now, t telling mm -hmm. these mm -hmm. stories, mm -hmm. which which uh, comprise, as we we're saying, like 73 years of, <laughs> of your life and work. Um, but where uh, where do you go from here? Well, I'm very excited about the new the next campaign that we're in in the Earthquake Action Team because we were asked by an international coalition to decided to gang up on Vanguard, Vanguard, which makes PNC Bank, the seventh largest bank in the country, look like a little <laughs> a little operation. Vanguard de deals with six seven trillion dollars worth of investment, and Vanguard loves gas and oil and coal, even coal. And so there they are on the one hand saying, we exist to assure your future. You know, lots of wonderful people believe in, it has a wonderful reputation for older people, economic security, right? So we are on your side for economic security. And at the same time, we are shoveling a nasty pit for you. <laughs> with your money. What we're doing with your money is destroying your future, and especially the future of your grandchildren. So it's a lovely contradiction they're caught in. And um, and my group, Earthquake Action Team, has been asked by the coalition to lead the charge in the area where uh, Vanguard is headquartered, which is southeast Pennsylvania, and that's our strength uh, in terms of population. So, uh, so I've already been arrested there uh, in the driveway of Vanguard, and uh, it's very exciting. Uh, campaign. So I'm, I'm eager to be campaigning with people one quarter my age. <laughs> the campaign is attracting young people because they know they have the biggest stake mm -hmm. in the future. And, um, and, and this is the way to do it, to go after the economic elite. The economic elite runs our politicians. Let's go after the people behind the people and, and go for them. George Lakey, thank you so much for joining us. The book, again, Dancing with History, A Life for Peace and Justice, and uh, just one of, what, about a dozen books that yeah, you've written 11. so far? This 11, is 11, number 11. Number 11, so um, <laughs> uh, definitely uh, a, a rich history that we can, uh, that we can mine as we, uh, as we talk about building these organizations to, uh, to create this new society. Thanks for inviting me. This has been a fun talk. <laughs>